So my name is um, Alex Normeister. I'm uh, the director of a uh, research program at uh, New York University. At uh, NYU, uh, we have a fairly large uh, PTSD program, and I'm uh, so, which is actually my uh, research background for the past almost 10 years now, um, on different places in the United States. Um, I'm Austrian, as you may have uh, figured out that I'm not a native. Uh, from a daddy. Um, anyways, uh, I'm also running a molecular imaging program and I'll give you a crash course of what that really means and what we are doing, the type of work we're doing. Um, and the, the real ultimate goal of the research um, that we are doing is to identify potential targets for treatment development. So this is really not only to write great papers, <coughs> to write um, conference, uh, presentations, but really to ultimately help the patients. And I think the research that we have been doing over the past 10 years um, seems to start paying off. So just very briefly, um, the people we're dealing with, we have basically, based on the funding sources, um, two big uh, groups of populations, and of course they also mix this, uh, those who work in the field, uh, with PTSD, which is one big group of combat-related PTSDs, mostly right now the people uh, coming back from uh, Iran and Afghanistan. And uh, the other big group uh, is a war, as I call it, um, which is often forget, uh, uh, doesn't get the, the necessary uh, recognition, which is a war that happens really at home, which is domestic violence and sexual abuse. And if we look at the numbers and when you go to uh, kind of uh, fundraisers and so on and so forth, everybody loves to talk about the war. But as, long, as soon as you raise your hand and say, hey, you know what, there's also sexual abuse, then people say, really? Um, actually, we do not want to give money for that, because that's something under the blanket, literally, unfortunately. Anyway, so those are our two big uh, patient populations, those with sexual abuse, domestic violence, and those with combat-related PTSD. But what's interesting is, irrespective of the nature of the trauma, um, the symptom complex that these people have um, is very similar. And you see it here on this slide. So it's basically three big clusters of symptoms. It's the re-experiencing uh, symptoms. So if, if I should describe in one sentence what is PTSD, then it's probably the illness where people cannot forget. And um, this is basically resembled in the re-experiencing symptoms. Then those are highly anxious people, so the so-called hyperarousal symptoms. And then, of course, they try to they try to forget what they can, and they try to avoid anything that remembers them and reminds them to the trauma, which is the big cluster of avoidance symptoms. And when we look at these uh, three big symptom complexes, then it's pretty clear that this is a very disabling disorder, and there's a large number of chronic patients, and as you may know, is that there's not in history and also not current, there's no single treatment out there, no single pharmacological treatment out there, that has been developed specifically for PTSD, and that's a true shame. But, but one of the reasons why this is, is because we only start to understand now, in the past few years, a lot more about the neurobiology of PTSD and about the neurobiology of the effects of trauma on brain development and brain function. And this increasing knowledge, as I will show you in a moment, will really lead us to develop novel treatments. So the next generation of treatments will be very different from what we have these days. Well, the symptom I'm going to, uh, sorry, the, the system I'm going to talk about today is the cannabis system. And um, the, the presentation also gives you a very brief outline the way how we in research think, or basically how I in research think, maybe, and, and my colleagues. So what we try to do is we try to develop very strong animal models, and then we try to do something called translational research where we try to verify those animal models and then bring those novel, uh, kind of the, the knowledge from these two sets of studies to the clinic, to the patient. And when we talk about the cannabis system, then we know from the animal studies that this system is a very stress-responsive system and really plays a key role in uh, the effects of stress, the effects of chronic stress and effects of acute stress. And when we look at one single target in this um, cannabis system, then we find the CB1 receptor. The CB1 receptor is really kind of the conductor of all the stress response involving the cannabinoids, and we find it in brain regions, and unfortunately, I have to torture you a little bit with vocabulary, but in the amygdala, in the prefrontal cortex, and in the hippocampus. So those are three brain regions we know from the animal studies and we also know from the human studies that really orchestrate the stress response. 
And what do cannabis and what do cannabinoid systems um, do in the stress response? Number one is they have a gatekeeper role. And what does that really mean? It means that under resting conditions, under basic conditions, so like you now, for example, you're not super excited, I guess. Not yet. <laughs> um, but under non-stress conditions, there's the, the cannabinoid signaling. Oh, maybe I should say one thing. Everybody in the room um, has his and her own cannabis system. And we all have our own cannabinoids in our body. So these are natural substances which we all have and which we all utilize uh, constantly, and they play a very important role in the brain development, for example. And on the, in the stress response, what this cannabis system really does is, it kind of prevents that our stress system is hyperactive all the time, of course. You know, because we cannot always run 180 uh, through the world, so we also need our resting phases. But in the response to stress, and this is a good thing now, in response to stress, the endocannabinoid levels, they, dec they kind of decrease transiently. And they basically, it's, it's like a leash, you know, it's, it's, it's like a, a group of dogs on the leash, you know. Once you let them off the leash, you know, then uh, all these uh, dogs start running around, and this is our brain, basically, in the stress response. It starts to activate, and it, it facilitates, basically, the induction of a stress response, which is a good thing, right, because when we face danger, we do not want to stay there. So we want to escape, so this is a very healthy response, in fact. And then it also, this cannabis system helps us to bring back these dogs on the leash and kind of calms them down again, because our brain does not want, as I said before, our, our brain does not want to run constantly on 180. So we want this acute response to stress, and once the danger is over, we want to recover and relax. And then, um, and, and uh, as I said, the endocannabinoid system, together with other uh, stress systems, such as the cortisol system, for example, plays a key role in this response. Now, you can imagine, if you have a change in your endocannabinoid system, the stress response is fundamentally different. And that really constitutes something that we call the disease states, and it may lead to the development of post-traumatic stress disorder, for example, of depression, substance use disorders, and so on and so forth. Well. All these animal studies basically, together with one very simple observation, which is that, as I said to, to you before, there's a big group of PTSD patients out there who do not respond to any available legal treatment, such as antidepressants, antipsychotics, all that good stuff. You know, that stuff simply doesn't work. And the field will really um, agree to that. So they use part a lot, right? And then when you talk to them, it turns out it, it works pretty well for many of them. So, what has been originally always a confounder in our studies, suddenly we, the, the field kind of made a, a switch, you know, and the paradigm shift and said maybe that's something they treat themselves for something that does not naturally work. And this could be, for example, a deficit in endocannabinoid function. And uh, I will show you evidence that this might be true. And at the end of the day, we end up in the work that I'm doing, that basically pays my salary, which is we're doing these in vivo translational studies where we put people into PET cameras, you see this on the little uh, box, and then we scan, uh, so we inject uh, radio ligands into these people, so small amounts of drugs which are radioactive labeled, that's not dangerous at all. Um, the amount of radiation you get is, for example, less than with the chest x-ray, right? So you would never doubt that the chest x-ray is very dangerous, right? And, um, and with the PET scan you get much less radiation exposure. So we inject, these, um, we inject these substances into people and then we do a acquisition. Basically we take a movie over about two hours how the brain works and how the cannabinoid system works in this case. And then at the end of the day we get the number and the function status of this cannabinoid system in different brain areas. So it's a super sensitive method. And um, it's very informative and it has only emerged over the past few years. Anyway, so how, the, how did this whole thing with the, with the self-medication come up? Well, actually maybe I should say one of those pet scans is about between six and ten thousand dollars. So you can imagine that the NIH, and, uh, who is mostly uh, the, institution, the institution that mostly funds our research, they're not giving you, say, two million dollars just because you feel like it and because you have a great idea, because great ideas, many people have those. So you need to have evidence, right? And so the, the basic evidence and the first step of evidence was besides the animal studies in people, a small study, 
where we looked at the endocannabinoid levels in people with post-traumatic stress disorder, this is the PTSD group, and then in two control populations. One is the HC, those are the healthy controls, so those are people who did not have severe trauma in their life. And then a group of TC, these are people who had uh, severe trauma in their life but did not develop post-traumatic stress disorder. And what you can very easily see is that the endocannabinoid levels in the PTSD group is much lower than in the other two groups. So that would really set the stage that there's something fundamentally wrong in the PTSD group. And then we looked at the, uh, and then we looked at the concentrations of these endocannabinoids to the symptoms of PTSD. And I told you before that one hallmark, basically, or one key symptom of PTSD is they cannot forget, is the re-experiencing. And what you see on this slide, for example, which is a simple scatter block, but what you see basically is the lower the levels of the endocannabinoids are, the harder it is for those people it is to forget them, the higher the re-experiencing symptoms. So nightmares, flashbacks are really high in those people who have these low levels. So that's another line of evidence that really suggests there's something wrong. Right? And then we did this PET imaging studies where we did the, uh, the movie, and the real value of these types of studies is that, you know, in industry, for example, so industry, uh, all the big companies, you know, they're all in the drug development business, and they have all great animal studies, and then they test the drugs in people and it doesn't work. Right? And so that's the end of the story, about $200 million later. And for the simple reason that for most of these drugs, this simple step in the middle is missing. Right? And in this case, we do have these in vivo studies in patients where we can show, for example, that in the PTSD group, and you see that in the box plot to the right, um, that they have higher levels of this CD1 receptor that I told you before is the key player, as kind of the conductor of the entire endocannabinoid uh, function in the brain of people. That this receptor is higher, and why is it higher? Receptors tend to get higher when the substrate that binds to them, the endocannabinoids, are lower. And you saw before, and the endocannabinoid tone is lower in people with post-traumatic stress disorder, so as a response, this receptor increases, right? And so this is kind of the in vivo evidence for two things. One is, obviously, in real people with the disease, they truly have a difference in the endocannabinoid function that leads to the symptom presentation. And it also reflects on the molecular level, so the brain starts to change in response to the deficit of endocannabinoids in comparison, again, to the other two control groups, to the TCs or the ones who had trauma but did not develop PTSD and the healthy controls so who had no trauma and also did not develop post traumatic stress disorder. And so you don't have to be a big imaging expert to see a difference, right, between these two bra three brains. And the, the brighter the colors, the more receptors you see, and you see that this change really occurs all over the brain. And what's also interesting is that the earlier in life the trauma happens, so sexual abuse unfortunately happens for children mostly, right? Six to 15 year olds are highly, or very often unfortunately, targets for sexual abuse. And <clears throat> what we also know from these studies is the earlier the abuse starts, the more profound are the changes in brain structure, but also in brain function. And of course, the earlier the abuse starts, for example, the higher the symptom levels of these kids, later also as adults, the higher is the suicide risk, and also the higher is the rate of complicated PTSD, for example. So PTSD, for example, with major depression or substance use disorders. So it makes them a very, very complicated group in terms of treatment, highly disabled, and often they cannot reach back to a normal uh, psychosocial functioning level. And it could be partly right here, you know, that these brain systems are fundamentally changed in their function when the trauma happens early in life. Oh, this is maybe another <coughs> interesting uh, observation that we found in these studies. We know from the literature, we know from, uh, the clinicians also know that, that in response to trauma, women are at higher risk to develop post-traumatic stress disorder, and that's a fact. Even though, that, for example, if sexual abuse happens to a man, or to a boy, they have the highest rates of develop PTSD. But even if you control for sexual trauma, women are at increased risk to develop post-traumatic stress disorder in the context of trauma. And that could be one of the reasons why, I mean, you cannot always explain everything with one chemical system, but this could contribute to this exaggerated risk. The simple fact that women, obviously healthy women, already at baseline have higher CD1 receptors and lower endocannabinoid levels <coughs> than men. 
that's a very interesting vulnerability factor for maybe a whole variety of different psychiatric syndromes that can develop over time. And this different also, difference also persists in the group of PTSD patients. And one of the interesting things that the field kind of faces is the fact that even in the face of trauma, only a small group of people develops post-traumatic stress disorder. So most people do not develop it. But then the key really is for those who have developed, uh, who have been exposed to trauma, to find those who have been at most, uh, who are at most risk to develop the disorder. Because you really, what you really want is not treat the disorder; you want to prevent it from happening. Right? And what we found in our studies also is that the combination of brain imaging in the, in the blue panel, basically, in the blue bar, so these higher CB1 receptor levels in the brain, but also in combination with lower cortisol levels, which is the other big stress system in the body of, uh, of everybody, and uh, plays a role in the stress response, and the combination of the lower endocannabinoid levels, so that these three factors together help you identify about 88% of people who are at exaggerated risk to develop post-traumatic stress disorder. And that's very important, because if you have these three kind of neurobiological variables after trauma, you are at increased risk to develop really post-traumatic stress disorder, and you would be very well advised to start treatment as soon as you can. And that's, uh, that's the value of these types of studies. Anyways, let's talk very briefly about the self-medication issue. And, of course, I'm not only making friends now when I'm talking about this slide, but um, that's uh, the nice thing about, uh, about uh, this panel and I'm welcoming questions, of course. So I told you before um, that endocannabinoid function is kind of not one, there's not one right value and everything else is wrong. So this seems to be a very dynamic system and there's a range of healthy parameters, and those healthy parameters are the endocannabinoid levels and also are, of course, the CB1 receptors. And I told you before that the simple fact that you're a woman kind of pushes you in endocannabinoid levels lower and pushes up your CB1 receptor level, okay? So the, the more to the red, the higher is your risk that you develop symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. For example, if you add trauma to your life, severe trauma to your life, that alone exposes you to risk to develop post-traumatic stress disorder, okay? But then if you're a woman plus trauma, you're at highest risk. And some, as I told you before, most people do not develop post-traumatic stress disorder after trauma, but some people do. So obviously they reach a threshold of lowering of endocannabinoid tone and increasing CP1 receptor concentrations in their brains, right? And then they develop a whole a variety of different symptoms, such as anxiety, irritability, sleep problems, flashbacks. And then they start, so they have the behavior and they have a change in brain function. And then they start to smoke pot, for example. And what, what pot smoking does is, and we know that also from our studies and studies of my colleagues, that smoking pot reduces your CB1 receptor levels, right? Of course, because it binds directly to the receptor, kind of. Uh, there's no deficit anymore, right? You, uh, you basically smoke one joint, you flood your entire system with more than enough. Right. And so that really systematically lowers the CB1 receptor level, obviously back into the normal range, so that's great. Right. So, uh, but then, you know, things can get a little out of control because some people just simply cannot stop. Even though most parts, chronic pot smokers say they have no problem to stop, you know, that's open for discussion. You know? But anyways, and then there's a smaller group of people who, smoke, who chronically smoke pot, and then they lower receptor down, and lower it further down, and lower it further down, suddenly you're on the blue level, right? And what do they develop? They develop symptoms of anxiety, irritability, sleep problems, they're dysphoric, they, their concentration goes down, right? So many of those problems which they started out with when they had post-traumatic stress disorder, for example. So what I want to say with this slide is, part is not for everybody. And POP is also not good for everybody who has post-traumatic stress disorder. So always be careful. And <clears throat> the field, unfortunately, at this point, does not have the biomarkers to really tell, you know, when you should stop, for example, smoking your intermittent joint, because it may help you, it may help mitigate the symptoms. But, you know, unfortunately, at this point, I cannot really tell you. I mean, we could do PET studies constantly, you know, but that's also not really fun. So, 
uh, and it's too expensive. Um, so, so there's there's a little bit of a problem, you know. And and I think I'm looking forward to the discussion about this point. Well, there might be alternative approaches. One of them, which we try to utilize, which is see one of the problems with THC is it works directly on the CB1 receptor, and that's maybe not very good in the long run. And we can discuss about why, right? But an alternative approach is to work with the endogenous system a little bit more. So basically not bring it in from the outside, but work with what's already available. And have a little, uh, how should I say this, a little biochemical experiment where you block the degradation, so where you block basically uh, the, uh, the lowering, the, the, the natural cycle of genesis and then also degradation of endocannabinoids by blocking the degradation with something called the fine inhibitor, right? So that's an enzyme blocker that helps you increase your endogenous cannabis levels. And the idea would be if you increase your endocannabis levels, since there's a deficit before, it should treat PTSD successfully. Again, the animal studies work beautifully. And um, the Department of Defense just recently gave us a fairly big grant to study this idea in people with um, combat-related PTSD. Um, now with the government shut down, everything's delayed. <coughs> but I hope still to receive them up soon. <coughs> and then uh, we will be conducting this study and um, the, the, the verdict is out. I just don't know the answer at this point, but it should work, hopefully. <coughs> anyway, so let's come to the conclusion. Um, basically, we find these new chemical changes in people with post-traumatic stress disorder. We find some interesting gender disparity, which basically gives some idea why people have a highest exaggerated risk to develop post-traumatic stress disorder. And we may have a set of biomarkers that help us identify those people after trauma which are at most at highest risk to develop post-traumatic stress disorders. And those are the ones who we really want to treat very early to prevent the development of the syndrome. Because prevention is always more successful in general than treatment. And at this point, I want to stop. Just want uh, to mention this is not a one-man show, as you can imagine, the whole group of people involved. And um, there's also uh, different uh, types of funding sources um, which are behind uh, this work that we have been doing over the past few years. And happy to take questions. And I'm looking forward to the discussion with the panel. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, now I'm going to have uh, each of the panelists introduce themselves, talk a little bit about. Uh, what PTSD-related work they're working on, or, or the organization is working on, they're working on research, what that research is about. Uh, feel free to comment uh, if you have any comments or thoughts on the presentation, um, and any thoughts just generally on, on PTSD. This is sort of the opportunity to, to, to start with what you really want to say, and then we can drill down uh, in detail if necessary. Hi, my name is Mike Lazuski. I'm Policy Director at Americans for Safe Access. I'm a last-minute fill-in for uh, Steph Shear, um, whose flight uh, got delayed and she'll be coming in later this evening. Um, the work that ASA does, we uh, are actively involved in the passage of uh, state medical marijuana laws. Um, and there have been a number of laws in the past that year that have added PTSD as a condition. We've seen that in Maine, we've seen that in uh, Oregon. And there's a number of states that are adding that uh, to their conditions list uh, or considering to doing that as well. Um, that is really the focal point of where uh, ASA is involved with uh, PTSD at this point. Hi, I'm Dessa Bergen-Seco. I'm a professor in the public health department at Syracuse University. And I also work um, in the research department at the Syracuse VA. And I do work with veterans um, with PTSD and trauma. Um, I also um, uh, used to run the uh, Sexual Assault Response Center, and we have a long history of working with people with sexual, um, histories of sexual trauma, and more recently work with individuals and communities affected by violence, which is um, by, by and large contributed to aspects of the, of the drug war. Um, so it's uh, a very, um, I just want to acknowledge, as as uh, Hugh and Alex had mentioned, that, that we focus on veterans and, and um, that's an understandable kind of clear concept of what PTSD is, um, but that that is also attributable and applicable to many of our communities that are affected by chronic violence and there is no respite in terms of um, the end of the, of the war. So that these same factors that we look at related to trauma are very um, salient in, in larger context. Um, I do not do work with psychedelics related to um, trauma and recovery. 
most of my work is looking at um, mindfulness and meditation and um, achieving the same ends, but in a much longer, slower process. Um, and I'll get into that um, in greater detail when we come back to that. Hello, my name is Marcela Talvara, and I'm one of the clinical investigators for a uh, study working with MDMA assistant psychotherapy for PTSD, for uh, chronic treatment resistant PTSD in Boulder. Could so, you speak just a little louder? Yes, sure. <laughs> um, I work with, I'm doing a study in Boulder, MDMA assisted psychotherapy for chronic treatment resistant PTSD. So currently we have three people enrolled and four people getting ready to be enrolled. And um, yeah, so I'll, I'll stop there. And I'm really glad about more research because the more we know about PTSD, the more we can figure out how it is that we are really going to treat it, especially when we understand that it does involve different brain functions. So. Uh, my name is Sue Sisley. I'm a physician from Scottsdale. I actually I practice internal medicine and psychiatry, so my practice is primary care for seriously mentally ill patients, but I have a large chunk of my practice is combat vets and first responders. Many of them have treatment-resistant PTSD, and so I've been uh, really um, overwhelmed by the, the current stories from these folks about how their use of cannabis has really um, helped curb a lot of the PTSD symptoms that they're dealing with. And so I was uh, fortunate to team up with Rick Doblin at MAPS and we started prepping uh, um, some marijuana research looking at, it would basically be the first double-blind randomized controlled trial looking at combat vets with PTSD um, treating them with five different dosages of marijuana, both uh, randomizing them into a smoked delivery method and a vaporized method. And, um, and sadly, that study has not been allowed to be implemented because of, uh, you know, for those of you who were in our session yesterday when we were talking about the politics of conducting marijuana research, you know, the big, biggest obstruction we have to conducting FDA approved marijuana research is the, um, the requirement that you have to buy study drugs from the government, and NIDA is the only source of, of marijuana study drug, and marijuana is the only Schedule I drug that requires um, this third review by NIDA in order to purchase drug. And so the problem with that system is, so after you've gotten FDA approval and after you've gotten your IRV approval from your university or whatever, um, you still have to go through NIDA to purchase that drug, and the, the challenge is, first of all, we don't, we're not really sure what kind of, what varying dosages of marijuana NIDA can produce. Our study um, ranges from anywhere from a placebo control to a 0% THC, which NIDA does produce, um, all the way up to 12% THC. Um, and again, we're not really sure if NIDA even has that in their <coughs> cultivation facility. There's one arm of our study looking at 6% um, THC and 6% CBD, and part of our hypothesis is that we believe that the higher potency CBD arm is more likely to produce um, a better beneficial effects for PTSD patients. And so that's what we're really eager to see the study get implemented finally so we can examine this in depth. Um, but it's really sad because this, you know, there's so many other um, Schedule One drugs that we know are far more toxic than cannabis, and yet this is the only Schedule One drug that, re that has this third redundant, unnecessary review by NIDA. And so that's what we called on everyone yesterday at this politics and science forum to ask them to send, you know, we created a draft letter asking <coughs> HHS to eliminate this review because it, it is important. We want, you know, as much as we can do, you know, we have, what, 20 plus states that have medical marijuana laws now. So we can do observational studies on cardholders now. And that, that's a very important source of information that we, we definitely need to capitalize on. But, um, you know, in, in my world, you know, in the medical community, randomized controlled trials are really the gold standard. That's what we all strive to look at. 
And so um, observational studies are important. There are real world studies that are, are going to provide us with a lot of information. We are going to pursue those um, because we can't get access to NIDA marijuana right now. But, um, uh, but, but it is, I think we still have to strive to overturn this rule because it is um, absurd and you know baseless. And I think that any of you guys who have any interest in helping us, I'd be happy to email you this congressional letter that we drafted and see if, if all of you in your states can, can help us um, put that forward to your electeds and see if they'd be willing to sign on to it. Um, it, 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 it I was, mentioning that you know the other schedule one drugs I'll give you an example we have a study looking at LSD assisted uh, psychotherapy in folks who have terminal you know end of life anxiety so folks who have a terminal illness and are dealing with very profound existential anxiety and so LSD assisted psychotherapy um, you get FDA approval you get your new Bay, I mean your University of Iowa approval and then you simply go buy, you know, LSD from a research lab. And you don't have to deal with this um, this um, NIDA, what we call the NIDA monopoly, which is this NIDA obstruction that we're, that is only, only exists for marijuana. And so I think when the public hears this story, they're just dumbfounded by how a drug like cannabis that seems to have such low toxicity is the only one that has this third uh, redundant obstruction in, involved. And so, um, that's why we, we wanted to make everybody up. So hopefully at some point um, we'll be able to to conduct this study and, and be able to make some things happen and advance the science. So thank you. Actually, you can keep that. Because okay. well, the, the next question I wanted to ask actually uh, was if you could elaborate a little bit on, um, you, you talked about the, 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 the research that you can do in the medical marijuana states uh, which doesn't quite meet the criteria that you would need to move something to the to the FDA, but uh, but there's obviously got to be something there that encourages you, and I'm wondering if you could comment on that, and then maybe a little bit I want to drill down into, into the barriers and what people can do um, uh, uh, to put pressure on you know, their elected officials to get rid of those barriers. And I'm going to ask you basically the same question, yeah. and, and then I want to then I want to get into the MDMA and the meditation, which faces a lot less barriers, is my understanding. So. It's, yeah, good questions. Um, I'd say, so for observational studies, I'll give you an example. For Arizona, we haven't yet added PTSD as a qualifying diagnosis. We've tried now three separate times. We've had three um, state hearings over the last two years, and all of, each time it gets struck down because their standard is randomized <coughs> controlled trials, and if you don't have controlled trials, then you keep, so we're in this quandary where we can't, move the, um, that kind of high-level research forward. Um, but so we're hoping, um, so the tricky thing then about trying to do observational studies is we don't have cardholders who actually have documented PTSD. So what we've submitted instead is a study um, for chronic pain patients who may have a secondary <coughs> diagnosis of PTSD, which certainly is many, many of our vets are going to qualify under that. And so we're going to launch that as soon as we can to try to collect observational data to then maybe persuade NIDA how urgent this need is because at this point they're um, apparently not convinced. I mean, we've been waiting three years now. That's the, the study was approved by the FDA three years ago and was immediately sent to NIDA and the DEA for their review. The problem is that NIDA has no timetable. You know, with the FDA, you send them the study design, they have to respond in 30 days. But NIDA has no such timetable, so they can take 10 months or 10 years to review that. And then what happens is, um, if you dare to say you want to look at the efficacy of marijuana in treating an illness, you get put into what seems to be a permanent review process that you may never emerge from. So, you know, if, if you want to look at the harmful side effects of marijuana or the abuse potential of marijuana, then you'll not only get the green light from NIDA, you'll probably get funding and, you know, whatever you want. But, if you, you know, because the drug is Schedule 1, that the, you know, DEA has defined that Schedule 1 as having no medical benefit. So, if you try to say that 
there might be medical benefit in, in your hypothesis. You, you put yourself into a really difficult position with the government. So, um, so it's really <coughs> tricky. And I think, um, you know, hopefully at some point, you know, with the help of DPA and all these other good folks that are trying to advocate for us, um, we may be able to get rid of that review, you know, that this third review and try. We, you know, I know you guys probably are well aware that Max has been pushing for almost a decade now to get a, a second cultivation facility in the United States. So right now, <coughs> only the University of Mississippi is licensed to grow cannabis for FDA-approved research. So if there was another facility that could possibly grow different, you know, more robust strains of marijuana and possibly high CBD marijuana that currently is not available apparently through NIDA, that would be extremely valuable. And I think that, you know, uh, thankfully the, the documentaries that we've seen from CNN and other, you know, these have been so groundbreaking for us. They've really opened <coughs> the dialogue in the public sector about how, um, you know, how crucial it is that we look at high CBD products as a potential to really provide a non-psychoactive alternative for folks who are sick. So um, I think um, the, the observational studies are going to be crucial and they're going to add a lot of weight to the, um, to the desperate need we have for randomized controlled trials. Yeah, and I guess it, uh, uh, if you can you comment on your research and the obstacles you're facing and what makes you optimistic. Okay. And the so, same question, I'm going to ask you guys for the same question as well. So. Okay, so our research is also funded by Max, And um, we have, it's a phase two trial. We have another one in South Carolina at the, at the moment and they're working with veterans, firefighters, and police specifically. And we have one in Israel and one in Canada that's just starting. Um, and you know, when you say, well, you know, how long does it take and is it easier? Well, that one took six years to get started. The one in Boulder it has been, it took about two years to get all the approvals, and finally, um, we were lucky enough to um, have <coughs> only two years. And so, this is a phase two double blind study. And um, we're treating 17 uh, participants, and all not specific for any PTSD. So we have uh, some vets, and uh, hopefully we'll have half and half uh, women, uh, male population. Um, and we, uh, we have teams of, there are two therapists, male, female therapists that work with every single participant. And uh, we have, uh, the model looks a little bit, we do, we do treatment with them to begin with, uh, to establish uh, alliance and really rapport with them and safety and trust. And then we do um, three MDMA sessions. If they get full dose and not comparator, if they get comparator, they can get up to five. So um, it looks a little bit, we stay with them for eight hour sessions when they take MDMA and they stay overnight in our facility with someone that stays with them. And then we do integrative sessions to really work with what has come up in the session and how are they going to incorporate that into their daily life. So we do that every single time. Um, it takes about, if they get full dose, it's about three and a half months. Uh, if they get compared to those and they want to go on, it's about five, five and a half months for them to finish the, the treatment. And we, we did one study in South Carolina already with, and we got very good results, 83%, uh, no longer my criteria for PTSD after the study. So we have really good promising results. Um, which is one of the reasons why we really are pushing for it and want to continue. Um, and, and mostly because I think one of the things that happens is that the MDMA really facilitates um, participants sometimes for the first time to really trust themselves and feel less shame and feel more present, um, more than sometimes they've ever felt. And this is something that we get a lot. The other thing that happens too is that 
uh, sometimes it's the first time that they have not been on an antidepressant. So they have to go off all medications in order to be in the study, which is one of the fears that a lot of people have. And even with that fear and how, how <coughs> difficult that is, um, we have about 160 people now on the waiting list, and this is without advertisement. So, so it's people that are really feeling there is no other treatment. I'm willing to do this as scary as it is to get off medication. Sometimes they've been on medications for 30 years. One of the things that I've noticed that all the participants have been saying is that even though it's so difficult to get off medication, they realize what the medication itself has done in terms of compromising their life. And sometimes they feel like, well, for 25 years I just didn't know. I didn't know that I, um, that I could go, that yes, I can have these this emotions that are so <coughs> difficult for me, but I also am enjoying the theater for the very first time in 30 years. I forgot that I loved music. I forgot that um, I loved the sun the sun setting. So it's really opening up also for them the realization of, of how they live their lives and how then is it possible for them to continue their life without having to take medication afterward, afterwards. And, and that's a, a really, I think that that is very, very possible for them. And they begin to see that as they go through the treatment that I am doing this on my own. I am holding this space and these emotions on my own. And therefore, I might be able to really do this later on. And so it's one of the reasons why we have three to five weeks in between treatments. So they can really start incorporating that. And they can really, um, it's difficult. Um, but then it allows them to have that trust that, yes, I can wait for the next treatment. And I can figure out how to deal with these emotions that maybe I haven't been able to deal with in my life. So, um, and, and one of the um, beautiful things that happens during treatment that I've noticed with all our, our participants, and um, I also participated, I was one of the therapists in, in a study in Spain, so I also have experience from there. Um, and it's that, they, that there is a connection that happens and the connection is very obvious during their treatment that they can, that they really make eye contact, that they really see themselves in connection to you and in connection to the world, and that they remember that, and that that is one of the things that they really hold on to. I was connected, I felt it, I remember it, I want to come back to it, and so it really allows them to hold those those feelings and emotions that they thought were not possible for them. Right? There's a lot of hope for them. And one of the harder parts is that I'm a psychotherapist and I treat PTSD in my private practice. And it's really difficult to see treatment resistant people for five years and they're stuck and that I cannot offer them a treatment that could possibly save their lives, could possibly um, give them a better quality of life and that I can't tell them, yes, there is something and you have to wait 10 years, 12 years maybe mm -hmm. um, for you to be able to get it. So that is a very, very frustrating piece that, um, that happens and I'm, I'm very grateful to be able to do the study and uh, you know, so we've come a long way, so we still have a ways to go. Were you surprised when you started seeing full remission? Because uh, we don't get that. With marijuana, we get you know symptom control, but right. you're actually seeing complete remission. And I think the full remission sometimes it happens because of reconsolidation of memory. You know, I think that, that, that something is going on that is beyond just the part that is, uh, that is really uh, context that is talk therapy that it really goes to process immediately and that when they start processing and they're able to really handle and stay with their feelings even though those feelings <coughs> might be um, what they struggle their whole life to avoid and what all their conditioning has been around avoiding those feelings they're able to actually experience them and so so reconsolidation is really about you have the memory 
and you allow the memory to be there, but in a safe context, and feeling good, and feeling less shame, and feeling empowered, and feeling united at the same time. So when the memory gets reconsolidated, it really is with that awareness as well. And so with that awareness comes the, also the awareness, these are my habits, these are the patterns that I've done in my life, and how can I begin to change those, because those are the ones that are really compromising my life. Yeah, um, I'll just um, build on that a little bit. One of the things, so it, as people are uh, have whatever view of lens uh, for or against um, the use of uh, psychedelics to address trauma, if we look at what the aims are for more accepted therapy, so like mindfulness-based stress reduction and then transcendental meditation, the uh, plethora of research that's emerged in the, in the past few years to show that the aims and the outcomes from that help in terms of this ability to let the memory surface and to integrate it and to make people prepared or ready to do exposure therapy or some of the other aspects on um, the sense of cultivating common humanity, um, self-acceptance, um, and the other aspects are the same attributes that we <coughs> here are achieved through mindfulness-based, or I'm sorry, through um, psych <laughs> psychother or psychedelic-based uh, therapies. So it goes back to sort of this, um, uh, I don't know if, it, if it's right to characterize it as an American ethic or whatever, but if you're, if you're going to grind through this <coughs> difficult hours of self-induced meditation and trying to concentrate and go through these things, yes, that's okay to get there. But if you're going to do it in a facilitated way with a chemical that might help you to fast track, buy <laughs> some of these things, right? Um, three months versus yeah, three yeah. years. <laughs> right. Um, that's not acceptable. So I think that might be one of the aims in terms of as we're looking at how can we adapt um, what's accepted practice in other realms and what we have evidence for in other realms that is then achieved by um, these different uh, components. That may be one way to advance it um, further. And I would just like to say that for the research I've been doing with, um, and I'm glad to hear folks also mentioned first responders um, and, and veterans and such um, struggling for often decades with uh, um, unresolved issues of, of trauma is that um, the, the process, um, I'm not quite sure where I'm going with this, I guess the, the aspect in terms of looking at the process by which we have gotten to a public discourse of acknowledging the existence of trauma across different areas and the need to address it, it's interesting that this consolidates with this kind of parallels with the, the uh, liberation we've had around some of the repressive drug policies. Um, one more piece I just wanted to touch on that with that is that for the veterans that we've had been able to work with and have uh, benefit with have very often been Vietnam veterans. And so our, our younger veterans that are coming back from OEF, OIF, or Operation New Dawn, whatever it is, um, are more resistant to engaging in therapy, and often the PTSD symptoms don't manifest or full, um, fully destroy somebody for almost a decade. Um, and so to think that, you know, if we just hold on and deal with, with the, the difficulties we've got at this present time period, we have no idea how long this is going to be you know, in terms of decades, just from those people affected by um, the military incursion. And then just finally, before I pass it on, to also recognize that um, this is not emerging out of uh, that this um, the work around use of MDMA for veterans with trauma. Um, a good friend of mine who is a West Point graduate, a Vietnam veteran, himself suffered for a long period of time, worked in the late 70s and early 80s with veterans with trauma using MDMA before it was um, <coughs> made into an illegal uh, the category that it currently is. I can't remember what schedule it's schedule. 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 Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> um, and so he found he had tremendous benefits and breakthrough with folks at, at that time. Um, so I'm glad that, that, that people are able to make uh, some of these connections and things. I'm wondering, um, Maggie, if you get it. Uh, uh, people shouldn't have to wait 10 years to get the medicine. Uh, that could save their life. And I'm wondering if you could comment a little bit on the political context, uh, but, but drill deeper into what people can actually uh, can do to, to speed some of this up. Uh, th then I have a question for Alexander, and then I'm going to open it up to the audience. Okay. Um, I think the physician at the end uh, explained it somewhat well that there's this 
third stage before NIDA will actually give you the marijuana before you can conduct research on it. And a lot of this boils down to NIDA's mission. NIDA is the National Institute on Drug Abuse. Drug abuse. This is not anything you know, medical research, medical, you know, greater medical research outside the realm of drug abuse. So unless a marijuana study is strictly about the abuse of potential of marijuana, there's little chance uh, that this it would ever get approved. Thankfully, there is a piece of legislation right now in Congress that would address this. Um, uh, the bill is uh, HR 689. It's, uh, it was introduced by Earl Blumenauer from Oregon. It was the same bill that Barney Frank had introduced a number of times to uh, reschedule marijuana. However, H.R. 689 has something in it that the previous versions did not. And this would um, remove NIDA's gatekeeper authority. NIDA would no longer be the government agency that uh, meets this. There's a UN mandate that says that you know, there has to be this one government agency that has the monopoly on marijuana. Uh, what it would do is it would require the Attorney General to select another agency whose mission is not solely focused on the abuse of potential of marijuana uh, to become the gatekeeper. And so this legislation exists and it's out there. Um, unfortunately, given the 113th Congress, it's unlikely that this is going to pass right now. Uh, certainly on the House side, I don't think it has a chance. Something that's pretty interesting, though, is uh, we've been getting a lot more meetings in U.S. Senate offices. And virtually in every U.S. Senate meeting that I've had, the thing that comes up is we really want to see research happen. You know, we say, look, there's this bill over here. Why don't you, you know, sponsor it? Not quite there yet. But what I think we should do as a movement and as activists is we have an off-year election coming up in 2014. We have a fairly sensible Senate that is probably going to remain fairly sensible. The House is up for grabs. We can make uh, medical marijuana a 2014 off-year campaign issue. I think marijuana in general could be a campaign issue for, the, uh, for this Congress. But in particular for the research angle, this should be something that we should be putting pressure on during the 2014 uh, election, trying to make sure that the candidates aren't going to maintain this repressive view on uh, medical research. Uh, you know, this, this bill has come up several times before, but it hasn't had this component to it. Uh, and it, it would, we think it would fix the problem, and we think it would enable a lot of research, not just for PTSD, but for a number of other conditions as well. So uh, that would be one way that we could uh, fix this problem. Does he have any sponsors besides him? Uh, there are, I believe, 22 co-sponsors at this point. Um, it's uh, a lot of the typical people who have uh, championed this legislation before. Um, and unfortunately, given the leadership structure in the House committee, it's not going to even get a, a committee hearing. Um, <clears throat> if we are successful in getting it introduced on the Senate side, uh, we think a committee hearing would be viable, but so far no senator wants to dip their toe and be the first senator to introduce a piece of legislation uh, that would reschedule uh, marijuana. Can I ask you a stupid question? Why was hemp so successful and why are you so negative about this? Because it, the hemp got into the Farm Bill 225 to 200. Um, it did get in there. Um, I'm, not, I'm not exactly sure why it did, but that's that's certainly part of it. Um, and I know on the Senate side for hemp, um, you know, Kentucky would be one of the uh, top states with this. Uh, you know, Mitch McConnell, who is the minority leader, um, you know, may have had uh, some, uh, something to do with that. But um, unfortunately, the, uh, the committee uh, leadership uh, in the House is not going to give it a hearing right now. Thanks. Um, and I, I would like to say, uh, uh, Republican Congressman uh, Benishek from Michigan, who is the chair of the, the Veterans Subcommittee, has said some interesting things recently uh, about the need for greater, a greater level of research on uh, medical marijuana generally with PTSD in particular. So if there's anyone here from Michigan, uh, uh, please come see me because we're actually going to be organized in this district. Um, I want to, before I open up the audience, I have one last question uh, for Alexander, which is, and, and, and Marcella hit on this, uh, that the current treatment for PTSD is inadequate. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how it's currently dealt with, what's inadequate, and then you know, how optimistic are you 
about the future of uh, dealing with PTSD? Uh, so it's, it's inadequate because I said before, and I think it's a, it's a well-known fact that there has not been a single treatment specifically developed for post-traumatic um, stress disorder. So all of the, the people get mood stabilizers from lithium to carbamazepine and so on. They get all sorts of antidepressants, which sometimes work and sometimes not. And then uh, they get uh, neuroleptics, typical, atypical, which do more harm than anything else. So it's kind of, the field is kind of very disappointing. And uh, if you ask me whether I'm optimistic, then of course I'm optimistic, um, but not only by nature, but also driven by the facts. So I'm a scientist and I would disagree with some things that have been said so far, uh, very much so in fact. Um, and I can detail what I'm disagreeing with. But um, one of the things uh, I really want to say is that the research over the past decade, for example, has really got us to the point that all the knowledge that we have learned over the past 10 years or more really brought us to the point that now new trials and new medications enter the arena of being tested in post-traumatic stress disorder, for example, which will really change the field. And I think this is the message of hope, basically, that I give to the patients, because they don't have to wait another 10 years to get a new treatment. They may have to wait six months, but I think that's acceptable. Can I mention one more thing? Oh, sure. Let me pass the bike down. I, I forgot to mention, George Greer, if any of you guys know him, he's a psychiatrist from New Mexico, and he asked me to give you this news hot off the press. Um, this is an observational study that he just got approval to publish, um, so it's not yet available, but it's really important because New Mexico does have PTSD as a qualifying diagnosis for their medical marijuana program, and he looked at 80 patients with uh, PTSD that was confirmed by CAP score. CAPS is the scale. It's kind of the gold standard in PTSD studies, and it... Um, and he saw a 75% reduction in CAP symptoms over the 80 patients who um, were using cannabis compared to those who were not. So that's a really some extremely valuable information that we do intend to forward to NIDA to help um, bolster the argument for our randomized control trial. So we have about a half hour for questions. I have. Generally, two roles. Uh, one role is to make sure that you ask a, a question as short as possible, and rule number two is to make sure that you ask a question uh, as short as possible. Uh, if people start giving very long statements, uh, we're, we're not going to be able to get to everyone, and my goal is to get to every single person who has a question in the next 30 minutes. So this question is, um, it, it feels to me like there's some concerns about MMJ in terms of the THC content. We all know that the CBDs are good. So is hemp being explored? Because hemp has the CBDs without the THC. So is anyone doing research on hemp? Okay, I, I don't know of any. I'm going to pass it over to these guys. Do you know something? Oh, yeah. in Cologne with the IACMS group and there are two CBD companies that are funded with lots and lots of money. It's primarily industrial hemp in China and Portugal and they're doing CBD chews and there's another one, um, it's the new synthetic THC that they're also using. And in millions of dollars, double blind controlled studies will be started with the Chinese hemp, which makes me kind of sad. One other point, I'm a clinician out of Tucson, Arizona, and we've tried in patients both the industrial products from Dixie marketed by hemp meds, as well as uh, whole plant extracted meds, and absolutely it's my opinion that the whole plant extracted meds are necessary. We need the broad spectrum of cannabinoids for us to have therapeutic benefit. And that, that's what I was going to say. You guys are talking about the CBDs and um, THC, but CBN helps with drowsiness. So sleep aid, that, that's really great for um, patients that are having sleep disorders from the PTSD. Um, I worked with patients in Washington State that um, 
use cannabis uh, vets and successfully and were able to get off multitudes of synthetic medications and they were able to get a quality of life that they were lacking when they came home. So um, with that in, in mind, um, with the NIDA um, um, cannabis, is it not um, GMO cannabis and will, will that not interfere with um, the test results? Would it be? It's not? I was going to say, if you've ever looked at uh, the NIDA marijuana that gets sent to investigators, it's pretty discouraging. It's, uh, you know, they send it in rolled cigarettes, they're about a gram a piece, and when you unroll them, it's mostly stems, sticks, and leaves. There's very little, you know, the bud material in there. So, um, a lot of people would argue that they're almost sabotaging the study right up front, especially if you're trying to do an efficacy study. Um, but it, it's really problematic, because, and I think that's why MAPS is so committed to creating a second production facility, because if we don't have, you know, we, we have uh, the expert lab, Craker, who is, you know, <coughs> renowned botanist and expert in plant growing, and he's, you know, he could grow some incredible material for studies that we could, you know, really learn a lot from. But, Unfortunately, I'm not sure. It, what's interesting is now that we have these 20 plus states that are that have medical marijuana laws, they're all talking about petitioning the government and maybe joining in Dr. Craker's petition. And so maybe if we can create this groundswell here where all these universities start demanding that the government allow them to grow their own, why should we all have to go through the NIDA process? So. This is for um, Alexander. Um, you said a provocative statement. I'd like you to expound on your what, what you meant by that you take exception. I, I really liked your presentation, and can you just tell us what you didn't agree with? Oh, I, I, my, my general statement for all who are doing research, and I'm doing research for a living, is never cut corners, never do harm. Oh, yeah. So, uh, Oh, sure. It's working now. Oh, it's working now? No, it's not. Oh, okay. Better? Yeah. Oh, definitely, yeah. No, so, uh, so my, my credo always is uh, never cut corners and never do harm, right? So those are the two big things. And uh, <clears throat> so in this context, I would disagree, for example, with the statement, it's very unfortunate that we have to wait 10 years. It, I mean, it is unfortunate. But for some things, we will have to wait many years to really know that the treatment is safe. Because, for example, let me bring up, many of you may like ketamine, for example, right? There's a lot of enthusiasm about ketamine, and only now the first longer-term studies for ketamine come out showing it's really not that uh, good of a treatment, and it's also not a very safe treatment, for example, for the simple reason it is toxic to your brain. And so, do you really want to cut the corner, kind of improve a treatment, give it out to everybody, and then 10 years later you find out that there's a substantial portion of people who get structural uh, brain damage? I don't think so. I don't think this is a good idea. So, unfortunately, while I would really make a very strong statement, you know, instead of kind of fighting this uh, war of drugs, put that money into research, Right. And it will benefit many more people, right? So that's my that's my credo. But never cut corners and never do harm. So that's the most important um, part for all of us uh, who are involved in research operations. I have another question for Alexander. Um, fabulous presentation. I'm I'm working with Lyme patients and cancer patients and other people with cannabis oil. Well. We're finding the parasympathetic turned off in some people who are so ill, the sympathetic pounding, and cannabis turning that response off so that they're treatable. Um, is there a way to follow your research, to have conversations with you from the clinicians that I'm involved in? Because it's fascinating, it's exactly what we need to know. Yeah, so, so a lot of the stuff that we're doing in the research arena is simply we do it in, as part of research because it's so expensive and nobody can afford it, right? Um, uh, but of course, you know, the implications are kind of immediate, and the people who we have scanned, for example, in our imaging research, over, it's more than 280 people over the past few years. Uh, I mean, we have saved the data, and unfortunately, PTSD often doesn't simply go away, right? So we know exactly who is a good candidate for 
one of those novel compounds and who is probably not such a good candidate for those novel treatments. And so the chain of events is kind of a logic one, and that's what I like. You know, I always say I'm a simple-minded person. You know, if I understand it, then probably everybody else does, right? And, um, and, and so it's very, very important to whatever we offer to those patients is evidence-based, and really we have to know what we're doing in order so if we do harm unintentionally, then we know how to correct it. Um, but to answer your question, of course there's a conversation, and we can always engage in conversations, what needs to be done to really individually characterize a patient in terms of his or her cannabis system, for example, and based on that information derive a treatment application. Is there a place to get your research now? Is it published? Yes. Uh, my question was also, you were talking about the structural damage. Does, doesn't pharmaceuticals create that as well? Yes, but that's not a good reason to do more damage. <laughs> and then my second question is indoor versus outdoor. Uh, anybody can answer this. When it comes to <coughs> cannabis as a product, what are you wanting uh, to have production in? Do you want to have production in indoor, or do you want to have production in outdoor meds uh, that's going to be effective for PTSD or any type of medical disorders? It wouldn't matter about indoor or outdoor. It would just matter about the genetic that you have, like whether it's really high THC genetic, which is most in the case to you around, or you know, <coughs> popping up like Canatonic or Harlequin, which have you know, equal parts, like one-to-one -one ratio, and you see the THC. Twenty-two to one, which would be more what we consider them for three to one, but the different ratios are very interesting. Did any panelists want to add to that, or should I move to the next question? Do you want to add anything or address? Maybe I'll throw one more thing. Um, I just, I, I really um, concur with the statements about first do no harm, but I also agree with Tess um, about the fact. You know, the pharmaceuticals that we prescribe to patients every day are, you know, riddled with side effects. It's really brutal. And one of the interesting, probably the most fascinating observational study that we have in every state in the country is our own poison control centers. And when I looked at the data, Arizona is now actively collecting data on marijuana um, because we've had a medical marijuana program now for three years. And of, I'll give you an example. We take about 65,000 calls a year. And in 2010, there were about 20 calls about marijuana out of 65,000. And when our medical marijuana program went active in 2011, we had about 25 calls. And, and then the next year, it was about 30 calls out of 65,000. And so I think that even though you know, most scientists would not consider that a legit study, you know, because we're not allowed to study this actively, this is the data that we can look at when people you know, cry out about the dangers, of, especially NIDA. I mean, one of the biggest obstructions we have to our study is that their concern is that we must conduct this in an inpatient setting that it is too dangerous to have our veterans using cannabis on the, in the outpatient arena, that, that they might have owner, you know, a, a, a onerous side effects or they might have, um, or they might divert the drug. And so the, the problem, you know, that's why I think that this data from poison centers is actually really valuable because all of our, you know, toxicity issues go, you know, they end up getting ramped through the poison center. So at some point, and you know, when you look at the 20 calls out of 65,000, they are things like, oh, I feel dizzy. And the, the, the talk center says, well, why don't you lay down for an hour and call us back? And then they don't get a call back because people, you know, end up, it's a very short acting medicine. And overall, we know that this is a, a, a relatively low harm drug and it's really, um, frustrating that these are the arguments that NIDA is using to block this research. Has there been a death from cannabis? Yeah, well, I, there's no documented deaths or overdose from Yeah, that's... But let me ask you this, you know, I feel almost I have to defend the NIH, you know, because for the simple reason... What are you defending? The NIH, the National Institutes of Health and the NIDA is yeah, But they're talking about NIDA. I know, it's part of it. Um, and the reason why I defend the NIH is there's nothing better than peer review. Right? So I don't understand why you fight NIDA. Why don't you team up with them? 
We try. <laughs> um, Believe me. I'll just throw this microphone down the line. And yeah. <laughs> yeah, neither doesn't want to do this. It's quite simple. No, they, they that's, don't, not, no, that's not true. Um, Alex, I'll, I'll try to respond to that question, which is I don't think you're fully taking into account the politics in that it's really important to do basic science, and I totally agree but that we're doing drug development research. And so the review that's done by the Public Health Service, they don't understand drug development research. They do not, they've not helped our protocol. They are looking at mechanisms of action. They're unnecessary for developing drugs. FDA doesn't require that knowledge. So we don't have to do the research that you did, which is extremely helpful to understand the CBD system, but we don't need that to develop a drug. No, you say that, I would disagree with you. Well, you can disagree with me, but the FDA agrees with what I'm saying. And we're dealing with trying to make a drug into a medicine. So this idea, you live in a different world, I think. The idea that we should just not fight the drug war and do the research. If we could do the research, we would do it. And it took us, when Mar Marcella said that it's a shame it'll take 10 more years for people to get access to MDMA, it took us 18 years to get permission for the first study. There's over 3,500 papers on MDMA, we understand the risks. There is no brain damage, holes in the brain that's gonna be discovered 10 years from now. So it's the research has been delayed. We're only giving a few times. There, there is no debate about that. The FDA doesn't believe that it's a, a risk in the context we're doing. So what I'm trying to say for the marijuana research is that we would like to do the research. There's no reason for NIDA to have another protocol review by people who don't understand drug development. They don't add to the protocol. And when we wanted to research with LSD, MDMA, all other Schedule One drugs, we don't need them. We're not asking for government money. We're talking about private money. But why don't you ask for government money? Because we're not, we don't want government money. We're not, NIDA is not going to give us you money. Want to cut the yeah. you know, no, it's I not cutting know. any corners at yes, all. Yes, you do, because you do not want to go to the, through the... No, we process. want to go through the FDA process. Pharmaceutical companies don't go through the peer review process when you they know, make a drug into a medicine. Their own opinion, but and everybody's not entitled to their own facts. And he's talking facts, and you're talking opinion. Yes. But, but my question, to get to a different political point, yeah, which is not so much to you, which is that we don't need a change in the law. And that's where I wanted to ask for people from ASAP, for Bill, you, what we, the federal government right now, the executive department has set up this NIDA review process. It's not Congress. So while it's important to try to pressure, you know, through trying to get a bill passed, we don't need that. We just need the Obama administration to change the HHS policy. It doesn't require a law. So maybe if we focus by getting congressional pressure on the administration, that would be easier. No, I think that's, that's a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> Any other commentary before I move to our next question? And I, I have an order in my head, so just raise your hand, I'll try to get to you. Hi, everyone. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Marcella, I wondered if you could elaborate a little bit on why uh, the patients that are going to come into the MDMA uh, study need to not be on any antidepressants, and if that has to do with um, just trying to do the science in a clean way that you know that you don't want another adulterant in the body that you're looking at, or if there, there's some inherent risk that um, that you're trying to mitigate. Well, we do want to find out exactly what MDMA does, and we don't want it to be, you know, what, is it something else that is causing the effects? We also ask that they don't change therapy, that they don't add new therapies, that they don't, um, you know, that they don't start something new. So we really are looking to see how MDMA works. You know, so that's that's one of them. But I think the other one for for me, from my standpoint, is I think. A lot of people who work with PTSD will agree that in order to work with it, you have to feel the trauma. You have to go there. And I think that one of the reasons why we don't have treatments that, existing treatments that work very well is because a lot of people on PTSD are on antidepressants, which block that part as well. So, um, you know, so it's, they need to be fully engaged in what they're feeling. What if someone uses cannabis? Is that, is that, um, also, they also have to stop. Okay, thank you. 
Hi, I'm here because I'm a physician and I've seen a lot of people get benefit from cannabis with PTSD. A quick comment or question is, hasn't GW Pharmaceuticals, the fact that uh, 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 liquid marijuana is legal in 20 countries, proved its safety, and the fact that the FDA has uh, approved a phase three study, doesn't that prove it's safe? But the real question that I have to ask is, President Obama said that he was going to uh, honor state law and he was going to honor science. And yet they turned down the study to have a second grow site uh, at the University of Massachusetts. So my question is, do you think that President Obama was lying when he said that? Or do you think that there were pressures that were put on him? And if there were, can you speculate on what those pressures were? <laughs> Yeah, uh, I, one of the things with Obama and his campaign promises, uh, they seem to somewhat be addressed in actual action, and um, so I think that there is some sincerity, but this is you know, being purely speculative on, on uh, you know, what, what's you know, going on in his, his thoughts. You know, we are seeing now with the new DOJ memo, there is... Um, uh, this could be a repeat of Akin, but it does seem like the atmosphere has changed in, in the Obama administration. They do seem that they do want to um, not crack down on laws that have uh, strong state regulations in them. So you know, we're seeing some sort of progress uh, from Obama, but um, uh, I'm sorry, what was the question in terms of... Well, the question was, what, why didn't he carry through on this particular campaign promise? I mean, particularly when it has so much support. I mean, you got the AMA saying we should have more research. You had the chief administrative law judge in 1988 saying cannabis was one of the safest therapeutic agents in mankind. And in his own autobiography, he said he smoked marijuana. I mean, what's what's the what's the holdup? Yeah, you don't know any more than I do. Yeah, exactly. I think that's probably true for most of our panelists. Is that right? Can I move on to the next I, I, question? Or did you I was wanna... wondering if Rick would be willing to address the GW pharmaceutical, because yes. since we have Rick here, it would be great to hear his viewpoint. So while you're walking over to Rick, I'll, I'll just Oh, okay, sure thing, and then yeah, we'll uh, get back to our order of questions. That I, I think one of the things with the Obama administration is there's a lot that doesn't rise to the highest levels, and I think this might be one of those things. Like, the, the administration just doesn't pay attention to everything, and it seems sometimes that the president is surprised by some... I, I think the president probably learns a lot of things by reading the papers. I mean, there's millions of things, you can't keep track of them all. And so I actually suspect that it's, it's less a conspiracy on behalf of the White House and more of just the bureaucracy and the drug war run amok. And, and it's our job to raise this issue, uh, to, to raise it to a higher level. Well, I'll just say on that point, the family friend of ours is one of the science advisors to President Obama. And I've talked to him about the way in which NIDA is blocking medical marijuana research. And what he said was that they feel attacked on so many different directions that they've chosen their priorities and marijuana is not it. So while they realize that that's a problem, they're just not going to do anything about it unless more pressure is put on them. Um, and where I agree with you, Alex, is about phase three studies are necessary in order to prove safety and efficacy. So with GW's work, they have not done the full length of studies to demonstrate to the FDA that it's proven safe and effective. They're working towards that, but they've not done that in the United States to the satisfaction of the FDA. So you can't really say it's proven safe and effective. Only in 20 other countries where the human beings obviously are different than we are here. Yes. No, no, I'm just saying that the FDA needs to be presented with that information. So I'm in favor of the FDA drug review process. I'm in, opposed to the scientific obstruction of that process. And that's where the Public Health Service review is an obstruction to that process. If the government wanted to develop marijuana into a pre uh, medicine, I'm saying let them spend all the money and do it. I'm not opposed to that. If the private sector or the nonprofit wants to develop marijuana into a medicine, we should be able to spend our own money and deal with the FDA. So I'm actually, in a way, the conservative wing of the medical marijuana movement in favor of the <laughs> FDA process. Thank you so much.